Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Hi, guys. Hello. What's up, what's up? On this episode of the podcast, we are going to be taking a deep dive into the concept of delayed gratification. We've got a few coaching conversations that we've had recently, a few um, videos thoughts from outside sources one a very outside source but some uh some kind of mind explosion moments before we get into that um we got a training camp coming up we have a training camp uh just outside of philadelphia friday october 11th in the evening for a quick session and then saturday and sunday 12th and 13th at crossfit raid uh, if you head to the link in bio on our instagram page you can find uh, where to get tickets there um Here's what I'll say. I, I think we get a decent amount of new subscribers for phase one, people that start to listen to the podcast, hopefully participate in our free Discord, discord.gg forward slash Misfit Athletics to get signed up for that for free. Um, and if you want to complete that circle and really get a true buy-in into what we're doing and be a part of the community, I think camp is is the best way to round all of that out. And the roster is a who's who of misfits that you want to know, um, you want to train with. And then the coaching staff, uh, myself, Hunter, and special guest, uh, Coach Carol, um, hey. the artist formerly known as Caroline Connors. Uh, Caroline Spencer will be there with us. Um, so it's just a, a really awesome experience, a really good way to um, participate in the community, learn from us, learn how to move a little bit better, learn how to think a little bit better, and again, have a good time. So make sure you head there and get signed up and join us at CrossFit Raid. And then we, before we get to the serious shit, as always, live chat. What you got, gentlemen? Ooh. Life chat. Football's back, which is exciting. Uh, okay, that is. I watched, is exciting. One, I watched one game. <laughs> as I was watching the game... Actually, I watched a little bit of the Rams game later on in the night. And as I'm watching the game, Jen uh, sits down on the couch and she's like, ooh, I like those helmets. I like the way they're airbrushed. And I said, those are not airbrushed. <laughs> those are definitely not airbrushed. Those are stickers. Oh, and I wish. she wanted to argue with me that they were airbrushed. So she texted our friend Preston, who uh, basically runs the media for the Kansas City Chiefs, follows Pat Mahomes around, does a lot of recording. And she was like, tell me, are these stickers or are these airbrushed? And I felt very vindicated in winning <laughs> that argument through via a third party. I'm so much of a fucking Larry that I've watched countless videos of them putting those stickers. On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those guys are good at that shit too. It blows your mind. They've just done it so many times. Some of them are. I saw yeah. a couple of clips from the Pat <laughs> sideline. Somebody sets their helmet down, and like you can see the tail of the Elvis is lower on one side and like bent on one. Costs again. <laughs> yeah, right. Fucking guy. His fingers aren't quite as nimble as they once were putting those stickers on. <laughs> yeah it is good news football season's here because that means sunday afternoon the golf course is <laughs> fucking wide <laughs> open boy there's, yeah. there's, there's a pretty good crossover between those who go. uh those who golf during the summer and those who watch a lot of football so uh i don't really have a whole lot of life chat i got sick as fuck after the masters crossfit games which was like yeah sick, <laughs> sick dog. Uh, which was kind of uh in hindsight, entirely my fault and expected went a period of probably like three days without stepping foot outside. No, no vitamin stack, no vitamin D, no calcium, no magnet or come on no guy, you know, your boy C brings a hundred supplements. You yeah, I know I should have. I didn't even think about it. I didn't even think about it then. I just thought about it after, as I was getting sick, I was like, wow, you did nothing to promote a strong immune system while you walked around with fucking six thousand people in a convention center and then mm -hmm. through multiple airports on the way home so uh, that was my first first real fucking sickness of the year Hopefully is your handicap still under 10 9.5 new 
Bro, Low. I'm gonna PR. tell the USGA about your fucking top golf. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I did, yeah, I did not record my top golf round in my uh, in my my gin handicap. So it'd probably be a fucking 65 if I did that. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, I I think the the biggest change that I made on the immune system front was like. I would always have all of the, you know, my vitamin C and, and zinc and vitamin D when I traveled. Yeah. Um, but the like, make sure you sleep really well and do that shit the week before you travel was the game yeah. changer for me. Cause like I would, I was literally a coin flip every time we traveled, especially if we went like over to Iceland or something, whether I would get sick within the next like two weeks. Um, so I tried to like hunt down like, what is even the point of any of this stuff I'm doing? And it's like, well, if you don't enter into this situation with a good immune system, why do you think you're going to be able to create one under right. stress? I'm like, yeah, fuck. That I really, yeah, I really hammer water before travel days. Like Dude. a couple of days before travel, I'm, I'm hammering water. I don't so, do much for the sleep or, you know, the vitamins or anything, but that <laughs> water. I honestly, I think, I don't know what the fuck it is about travel, but like I need... I think it's like like underlying stress. I need more food and more water always, every time. I get so fucking hungry on airplanes. Oh yeah. I'll bring like two, three thousand calories worth of snacks, and they're gone in like minutes. <laughs> I'm like, I, if I tried to eat that much beef jerky at home, I would get very bored and stop. But I don't know what it is on airplanes. I can't fucking stop. Um, so weird. It's like a road I, trip. It's like I have so many snacks for this road trip. Just ate them in the first forty three minutes. It's like, yeah. That's why, why I go sunflower seeds. Oh, it's like so I'm not one. as much of a degenerate as I played baseball with some people that ate the shells. It's like that is a prop. The, oh, Daddy, it makes, you it makes your poop hurt. <laughs> it makes your poop scratchy when you eat too many uh, sunflower seeds shells. I was listening to, but there was a guy that ate a whole bag in one one of the big bags in one sitting with I the shells, and he ended up in the hospital. Oh yeah, that sounds right. He, like couldn't pass it. <laughs> That's I mean for the first I don't know. It's, 20 years of my life that's the only way i ate sunflower seeds shell and all now i'll modulate a little bit i'll spit the shells out i'll eat a few here and there just for good old times but yeah you get they're so salty the, and delicious stand in the outfield for 57 hours and do basically nothing um, when you're playing baseball you get bored enough to to really hone in on your shell cracking skills <laughs> yeah that was a uh, that was a uh, in the field experience in the military so when you're not doing something specifically tactical just like well i'm just gonna fucking stare at the sky and chew on these sunflower seeds chewing on seeds the only thing more boring than playing the outfield is being on the pitching staff on a college baseball team because if you're not pitching you ride the bus and you sit on the fucking bench <laughs> and you do nothing nice. but eat sunflower seeds and fucking chew gum good times um yeah, the hydration thing. So, I if you've been listening to the podcast recently, I've I've had my jug of water everywhere with me and I'm doing uh it's a ga- it's a milk know. gallon, used milk <laughs> gallon if you're curious. Um I also mentioned that I'm trying to shoulder press 225 pounds. Um and How's that going? It's good. I haven't run into so so the way that I do the way that I program long term linear progression is a lot different than what I would do for like a, a training phase because there's the end goal is a is a specific date when it comes to CrossFit, right? For me, I can ride linear progression as long as I want. Um and just sort of go on down the line and go from more reps, lighter down to heavier. So like my sets of 10, once I fail linear progression, adding five pounds per set per week, I will go down to eights and then I'll go down to sixes. And then my fives will turn into fours, which will turn into threes, which will turn into twos. Um, and I'm like five weeks in and I still haven't failed. A, I still haven't failed a set, but yesterday would have been, and it was an endurance type day. So 10s on the shoulder press, 10s on football bar bench, 15s on incline. So like a lot of reps. Yesterday was the first day that I forgot my water bottle um, and did not hydrate the way that I wanted to. And there was a noticeable difference in power output. Like I could tell. 
and I had a crazy pump afterwards. So I don't know. If you want a crazy pump, don't drink water. You won't be able to hit the reps to make you actually stronger. Um, but like my fucking triceps and like delts, I was looking thick. Is that just because you like need the electricity flowing to actually use your muscles? Is that what it is that the hydration? Yeah, that's a huge. That's you? a huge part of it. And then, um, as you get further and further into the sets, and your core temperature goes up, you can't recover as fast. So people who are able to keep their core temperature down. Um, can continue to put their body through certain things so if you can't sweat and cool yourself off um then you're going to be able to do less and less and less um so it's actually it's it's funny we make fun of people like sherb for his sweatiness but it's actually fairly efficient you just have to drink a shitload of water to like counteract spitting all of that stuff. i wouldn't go that far with sherb <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, back to general life chat. Uh, yeah, football, I would say, would be. Football's back. Football is by far my favorite sport. And while I get bored watching seven hours of commercial free football, shout out Red Zone, um, <sighs> it is the probably the strongest way that I keep in touch with my college friends that um, live like far away. So, like, you know, I'm sharing a meme about, have, have you guys seen the, I know this is earmuffs if you get your kids listening in the car, but you've seen the meme of science shows that if you get stung, your dick gets stung by a bee, that it permanently stays enlarged. And then it's the Kylo Ren meme where he's like, I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the courage. To <laughs> <laughs> like sending shit like that, like, and life gets busy enough where even your group chats die. And it's like, damn, yep. shucks. So Sunday, front load the parenting. I'll get him up. I'll feed him breakfast. I'll hang out with him for like five or six hours before football starts. Lunch, put him down for a nap. I'll come back around, put him to bed. He just got this little window, this little one to seven window. This little seven hour window. Seven hour window. <laughs> no, no, it's at six hours. Uh, and I come up every once in a while to check in. He's also asleep until like maybe three. So... I'm doing the bulk of it. I'm just throwing that out there. I can't get in trouble because Maya would never listen to this. Um, <laughs> and then you just fucking watch football. Does it's he watch great. football? He still has not watched TV. Oh, okay. We're, we're the, the initial... By choice or parenting selection? He hates TV. Selection for sure. Yep. He fucking hates TV. <laughs> Good for um, him. The initial... Research that I looked at said 18 months for brain development. There's like a massive difference between kids who stare at screens and kids who don't during that period of time. And then another one just came out out of, it was definitely a Scandinavian country where they're like very serious about the two year mark is actually a really good goal. Hmm. Our doctor was like, Hey, do it as long as you can, but like, don't be a psycho. Don't be that parent because you're going to create the opposite situation at some point. So it's the same as, you know, you can't have this, you can't have that when it comes to diet. Um, so last year I could set up my we sell mats.com purple mat in like a wedge shape and put him like on his back in the, in the corner and have all his toys around and I could be looking up over the mat, but no. He would karate he moved, chop that thing much. down. And, yeah, no, that kid's all over the fucking place. He ain't sitting anywhere for any reason whatsoever. <laughs> um, so we're 16 months in so far without having it, which I think is pretty good. Yeah. He's a little too smart, though. It's kind of freaking me out, so maybe maybe a little TV soon. <laughs> Dumb him down. <laughs> Could reverse that right quick. <laughs> yeah. You're kid, you're too My smart. Leaves. Watch we're this. Just, we're just watching the the most te- we're trailer park boys. <laughs> just watching yeah. the presidential debate. You're like, oh, ah, there he goes. Uh, back uh, to really baseline. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to, I have, there's three levels of questions, Hunter, that I have for you. I like it. Um, the first one is the initial conversation that I had with another coach about the concept of delayed gratification quick you know hunter you can feel free to give your own definition when i ask the question but um for people listening in context of what we're typically talking about is the idea of work that is done now sort of slowly over time that ends up getting you a result further out in the future um 
So just kind of buying into these concepts of like, like zone two would be a really great place to start. Cause a lot of people are like, the fuck am I doing? This is boring. Um, and then people go from not going to the CrossFit games to qualifying every season. So like the conversation that I had was with a coach who has an athlete who really buys into the concept. It's just like, tell me what to do. I'm in like, you need to explain it to me. But once we're on the same page, like marching orders, I'm good to go. And it was really just us going back and forth talking about what makes the kind of athlete that does buy into delayed gratification, what makes the kind of athlete that really struggles with that. And then, you know, is there anything that we can do about it as coaches? Um, That sort of thing. So I'd love to hear your perspective on it, Hunter, when you when you think about just the overall concept and then kind of the spectrum of athletes. Yeah, I mean, I think broadly the the your definition like works well enough. I think just the again kind of broad think of it as kind of the sacrifice of the present for the future um, is an easy way to think about it that can apply you know to a lot of different areas whether it's life or fitness. Um, when it comes to fitness specifically, uh, and you know, we can obviously get into a lot of the whys and whatnot. And I think you and I would probably both agree something like social media has has obviously caused that concept to run rampant. Rampant. I used to I, personally, I've always been somebody who, um, maybe maybe to my own detriment, would would delay things uh, in in hopes of something better coming along. And I think that the extreme version of that. Um, also just kind of thinking, thinking about myself is never actually, you know, never actually seeing, I either sticking around long enough to see the, the, the gratification come to fruition or changing courses to like too soon, um, you know, before there's actually been enough time to actually see that or, and, and this is especially true with fitness when it, when it, when there is no, um, in a sport that is constantly evolving and and increasing in difficulty, uh, the target is constantly moving. So it's one thing to you know delayed gratification in the sense of like, well, you know, I'm gonna work until I retire at age whatever the retirement age is now, um, sixty nine, sixty nine. And there's a you know, and there's there's so there's a timeline associated nice there's a timeline associated with that there is a there is kind of a fixed endpoint but when it comes to fitness um and you know trying to compete at a high level in the sport whatever that is for you um it can be it can be frustrating to know that you know a lot of people inherently know that what they need to do uh, like what they need to do but the unknown of when these results are going to show themselves and whether or not the results that I receive will actually be good enough to achieve the goal that I, in theory, am delaying this gratification for can be really, uh, really difficult on kind of the psyche of an athlete. So um, I think those are kind of my my opening thoughts on that. All right, Ted, let's uh, fire up the Tyler, the creator video. Um, For those who don't know Tyler, the creator, rapper odd future guy um if you haven't listened to it igor is one of the greatest albums ever made um real real funky kind of out of left field and he's oh man i don't honestly don't even know how i would describe him because he's a genius but he's also he's got a lot of range he's a genius but like He'll let somebody have it. He's fucking hilarious. He's a wild man. Yeah, he's an interesting really dude, that's for sure. Yeah, it's not it's not easy to box him in and <laughs> describe him quickly. Um, right. I would actually recommend listening to this to this whole interview if if you're a fan or, or whatever, um, intrigued by it. But it's the Spring Hill podcast, and that has some sort of relation to LeBron James and his whole media empire. But anyways, here's the video. I should like. What did you learn music? I just learned it like listening no. and just studying and stuff. Piano taught yourself? Yeah. Like just bought one in the crib? How did you teach yourself? In the seventh grade, I <laughs> I found myself printing out She's Alive by 103,000 off the Love Below and thought I was going to teach myself how to play it. 
couldn't read music. I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> so I just learned it by ear, and then from there you go from playing two oh, you, notes to But that three you must have to be patient as fuck to hear it and go, where is that? Because you have to find the sound on the. Yeah, but patience is relative depending on what you care about. That's true. That's all I wanted to do. So like, it wasn't like, oh, I want to hurry up and do it. Like I enjoyed figuring it all out. Like. Patience is relative to what you care about. Yeah, that was a good yeah, line. For real. And it's obviously off the cuff kind of a thing there. And I just, the athlete in question really fucking cares. That is very clear to me. Um, and that's one of those moments where, you know, sometimes, and I think it's really good for this podcast, and I think it's good for, for our coaching staff and our company, sometimes hunter and i will sit on opposite sides of the same coin in these conversations when we talk about like can killer instinct be can you breed it basically can you like make it happen with someone can you build that and i like to think that we can move the needle on this stuff but then i watch a video like that and i think about why i do what I do and why I love to program, et cetera. And it's exactly what he's talking about right there. And then these athletes who are the example that either we are chasing or someone else is are also that. So then you get into the mindset of like, maybe that is just what it is. Like, and maybe you can cultivate interest and you can help lead someone down a path, but like exactly what he said, like the, the, the people that just buy into it and get after it and are willing to work for years to end up in a place are people who are very interested in what they do, passionate about what they do. Yeah. I mean, I think his that that quote, can you say it one more time? Pa it, patience, patience is, is relative right. to how much you want it to what you uh, care about, to what patience you care about, relative to what you care about. Yeah. It, and, it, you know, a lot He's of times I like he isn't patient. He's like, that's just what I wanted to do. Right. And I think yeah. that, like, I think thinking about kind of the extreme end of this, right, it's like, you know, someone someone comes in, you get a lot of, we get a lot of that at the affiliate level. Someone comes in and they get really excited about CrossFit and they're just like, oh, I want to learn how to do a muscle up. And then I tell them like, okay, like, here's what you're going to start with. You're going to start with this kind of pseudo false grip and you're going to do 10 sets of five kip swings every single day for the next week. If you do that for the next week, then I'll tell you what the next thing that you do is. And, you know, if I had a batch of 10 athletes who came up to me, three of them are going to come back to me and say like, okay, I did it. Now what's next? And that might even be a little bit generous. And the point here just being is like, you know, the different the difference here is what you think you want to do. And then when you realize like what is actually required and kind of the minutia and the monotony of pressing every single key on the keyboard until you find the right note, then remembering that, then finding the next one, and then the next one. And in a vacuum, it's like these are all just like singular random notes. These are singular random skills that are part of a larger movement or a part of a larger song or whatever it is. Um, and it's not going to make sense. It's not going to sound good until we can get to a place where we start to see all of that come together. And then, you know, there are a fucking thousand it's the it's the cartoon of the dude digging underground with the axe and like three three more inches of digging and it's like the giant gold mine but you see him like turning around and walking away with the axe because he's just like i've been digging for too long and it's not there um and we i think that's that ultimately is the limiting factor i think on on pretty much everybody so whether you know there's obviously uh a limit to what certain people are capable of doing in, in certain areas of their life. But I think if you find, you do find something that you're passionate about, something that you don't mind pressing every single key on the keyboard until you find the, the, the correct one, if you find that thing for you, then there might not be a limit to what you can, you know, achieve in that respective realm. Yeah. The, um, there's a, a guy who's a graphic graphic designer graphic artist um who i think I, i've referenced it before i think a lot of crossfitters follow it hopefully i'm one of the reasons why but visualize value and he just tries to take very it's like the black concept. and white kind of art yeah. stuff yeah yeah he's been ripped off a lot by a lot of people which i guess is a, a kind of a hat tip um if you can get to that level where people rip you off 
Um, and his, his version of it is the graph with the like low tick marks up to a certain point, And then you see the trajectory going up and right before the trajectory goes up, it says, this is pointless. It's so like this yeah. person has done all of that legwork for the delayed gratification and stops before they hit that point. Um, all right. Yeah, the the problem is is you don't know how the long the delay is. <laughs> that's that's ultimately it, right? That it's the yeah. delay and delayed gratification that get that people get hung up on. Yeah. All right. Counterpoint essentially in the next video. This is from Hard Knocks. This is Nick Saban talking to Matt Eberflus, who's the Chicago Bears head coach, about the expectations put on Caleb Williams. Can you guys hear that? No. Is there no sound? No, there is sound. It's just not playing right. Can you can you share it from your screen, Drew? Someone else is. Uh, if you turn that off, then I probably can. Let's, let's try. I should probably open it first. That'd be a good idea. So this is expectation set on does it matter who this player is or what yeah, position so Caleb the player Williams plays? Williams has essentially been the like the next you know who's who's going to be the number one draft pick for like three years in college football, um, and he was drafted this year by the Chicago Bears. So he's heading into his first season in the NFL. Um, played his first game two days ago. No audio. <clears throat> We're not getting any audio, Drew. Damn. Let me see. Why did the other one work? <laughs> uh, the other one was uploaded directly to the platform, uh, not not screen shared. Let me see if I can reduce it. its file size, and then maybe I can upload it direct. So I'll go back a little bit to the. And, um, go ahead, Hunter. Sorry, it was and I, I, I even I know who Nick Saban is. Is he is he in the NFL now? Is he a He's NFL? Okay, that's what I thought. Well, yeah, yeah. I did not think he was in the NFL, but I was confused. He tried. Uh, he was a Dolphins coach before he went to Alabama, and it did not go well because the players were like, "I'm not." 18 years old don't fucking talk to me that way yeah <laughs> um there wasn't quite the translation there but I, I feel like a lot of people listening to this will know who nick saban is but for context kind of out of the bill belichick coaching tree and just very much a leader of men like i think he has a he's he's very strict in what he does um but one part of the video that's actually not going to show up on here is he continues to go on in saying the way that he treats his quarterbacks like he always wants their perspective before responding so like what did you see in this situation how do you feel you did here and then if he's going to rip them a new one he's going to do it in private so like like he knows that if i if i knock this person down a peg in front of other people that can affect how they look at that person etc so he's there's a lot of nuance to to what he does and some some really cool things that he stands for as a person but Let's see if this works cool here's my theory on why nfl quarterbacks fail at such a dramatic rate mm -hmm. to me expectations are a killer this kid you got this kid's got so much media so much hype so much expectation on doing well and he has to develop so quickly to meet the expectations that everybody has for him, it's almost impossible. Because there is there is a development phase too. It's the first year as rookies, second year, and as a third year, they, they got it once they, they're in our system. And I think that's the biggest thing you gotta worry about with your quarterback, right? Because the expectations are a killer. But yet, to use your word, development is the key for him. You know, like Peyton Manning threw 28 interceptions when he was a rookie. 
And this is the most in the history of all. Ted loves watching that part. Scoreboard don't mean anything until the game's over. Let's do it. Let's do it. How's Caleb looking? How's that offense coming together? Really good. Caleb Williams, how do you think he's going to do it? Human nature is to be average. It's to survive. It's not to win a championship. It's not to be the best you can be. It's none of those things. And we think as coaches that just because the guy's a good athlete, he, he wants all that. Yes. Now, every now and then you get a guy who's got all the right stuff, who's a great leader, who does everything right. I mean, you were that way as a player. But there, there's not very many guys like that. You got to make them that way. The end, obviously, a, a very much what I was looking for, but I felt like the context was important there. Um, I love the idea of both of those concepts swimming around in my brain of different perspectives, because essentially what he's saying is, you know, if we go back to music, Tyler's the exception, not the rule. So our job as coach, he, he doesn't have a coach. Our job as coaches is to identify when the person needs us to to help them get to that point, help them develop. You know, I think a lot of uh, mental adaptation can be done through linear progression, um, you know, sort of understanding where you're at and slowly building and turning into the person that you want to be. Um, but those, to me, like when I watch stuff like that, those perspectives, I think both of them are incredibly important and they're essentially opposites or at least close to that. Are you saying opposites in the sense that like not everybody's wired like someone like a Tyler, the creator, obviously, yes. like obviously that's true or just not everybody has that desire to like, or uh, I guess that's saying the same thing. Well, so I think what's interesting about it is I think the desire is possible, but the character trait might not be there. Like I, I've worked with people where the desire was very strong and they needed help finding that part of them. Yeah, so the, almost like that second step. So Tyler, the creator, it's like, I want to learn the piano. I don't know how to do this. And I stop versus yeah, exactly. like, oh, I'm going to take that step, find the first key. You know, not everybody needs that. So you need that. The coach, the, the mentor, the, the whatever. The spectrum to me are so fucking obvious, and it's really hard for me to to work with them and kind of believe in the idea that we could make a change. We had a guy come into the gym, man, not 10 years ago, but maybe seven years ago, and he was, um, I, I believe he was like a national level in the decathlon. Um, it was just like, one of those guys that saw the CrossFit games and was like, there's no way these guys are fitter than me. It's not possible. So he came into the gym and was like, I want to win the CrossFit games. We we're like, wow, well, I mean, okay. Like, <laughs> you're going to do a muscle up first. Good luck. And <laughs> he, I don't know that he made it a full month. He trained very hard. He did a lot in a short period of time, but was discouraged at a higher and higher and higher and higher level every time someone with 30% body fat fucking crushed him <laughs> in that con. <laughs> so, like, Good. it was so obvious what was going to happen, to me anyways. It was like, I'd see this person come in. Like, I didn't really, I wasn't the coach that was the one that was like, oh, we've found a diamond in the rough. Let's work with this person. Um, and I could just, like, it's like, oh, one of the wheels fell off. It's got three left. There's two. He's dragging the caboose on the fucking ground. The sparks flying everywhere. Like we're down to one wheel. He's barely moving, and then he was gone. And like, I, I haven't heard about him since. Do you um, think that's a function of of CrossFit itself? Because I I don't know that you would have the same. And I guess maybe maybe you have. What what would be the equivalent level of someone walking into a coach's office and say, "I want to be in the NFL." What's that? Is that like a high school kid saying, walking into the office and saying, I want to be in the NFL? Someone like a third grader, you know, like, well, it, what? Like there's, so, there's so a Caleb level of actually there's... the right. Caleb's actually the right example because yeah. he's like, when he does interviews, he's like, 
I was a run. I was actually used to be a running back. And you're thinking, he's talk. Obviously, has to be talking about high school or college. He's talking about when he's like six or seven. And when they, when we made the move as a fucking little boy to quarterback, he's like, that's when it started. We're going to the NFL. Me, my dad, my coach. That's where we're going. We're going to the NFL. This is the diet I ate for like nine years in a row. Like this is how many throws I made, et cetera. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the qualifier with the guy that I'm referencing that came into the gym is the writing was on the wall from the beginning. Sure. Um, you're not going to, no one has ever, nor will they ever win the CrossFit games the year that they start CrossFit. Like, if you did well in the open, that would be very impressive sure. if you were able to pull that off because of the modalities that we go after. Um, so honestly, like just a bit of a like roller coaster of trying to think this thing through and thinking about, about the way that I communicate with my remote coaching athletes and then the way that we communicate on this podcast because people are going to end up in these different sections. So the ultimate goal of something like this is to say like, what is delayed gratification? How long are you supposed to delay this shit? Like, like how patient do I need to be for this to actually happen? Um, because I think people, there would be people listening to this podcast that are all the way over on the, like, I just love this and that's why I continue to do it. And I'm totally okay with taking baby steps every day. And then there are other people who are like, I really thought this was going to be quicker. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And then everyone in between a lot of people yeah. to, to address. Yeah. So much of it has to do with life experience up to that point. Right. And, and the level of success that you've had in the various endeavors that you went through. If you're somebody who, you know, did go to school and, you know, was able, was able to, you know, get good grades without, without trying particularly hard, was naturally athletic enough to, you know, make varsity as a freshman, but, but eventually peter out. And we see that, I remember seeing that even as a, as a, as a high schooler, when I would say I was maybe a little bit, it may it just maybe more mature than the athlete that I'm thinking of in my head, where it's just like, man, I can see, like, you can see how talented this kid is on, I, on, as a hockey player. It's like, he's got, I don't know exactly what it is, but he's kind of got it. Um, but the at it like he's either he's either never been never been disciplined in such a way that that is going to enable his like long term success or has just never had somebody say like sit them down and say like hey man like you're pretty good at this like we could like let's you know without without the the key here is without setting like these unrealistic expectations especially for for young people um but like hey this might be worth putting a little bit more effort into and taking a little bit more seriously, if for nothing else than to see how, how far along you can take this. But uh, it's a fine balance of knowing when to either help somebody set up an expectation or probably more often on the other end, like rein somebody's expectations in, especially when, you know, we've had, we've had athletes in more recent years come in and say like, I want to go to the CrossFit games or at least do so, you know, over the phone or whatever. And it's like, it's like, okay, like, fantastic. Thanks for this. What's your 2k time? 715. Got it. Like, we'll see you in like, like 10 years, maybe at semifinals. Um, but it's like, it's finding that balance of like, is this person, does this person actually have potential, not necessarily the physical gift, uh, potential per se, but the right blend of, physical gift and the willingness to you know find the right key on the keyboard so to speak yeah the one of the reasons why these topics are fascinating to me especially within the context of crossfit and strength and conditioning is because that's the trajectory that i had to take i think not even as an athlete but as like a human being like i School was, was fairly easy for me from like a testing standpoint. And then I could throw a ball hard or far. And that just allowed me to, to, you know, play sports at a somewhat high level. It never crossed my mind until, until I sort of attached my self-worth to, to being an athlete, to like 
work on the thing once the season was over. It's not that I was presented with this plan and was like, if you work really hard, you could be really good. Nobody ever fucking said that to me about any of it. Yeah. And it never crossed my mind. Like, I did not touch a football after football season. I started touching a basketball and then a baseball and then dick around all summer long and maybe lift some weights, but like definitely not going to pick up a football, which now it's like the, I can't even fathom how no one was like, you might want to throw that thing before double sessions. Do you wish somebody had done that for you? Uh, yes and no. So, so I have two, my two, like my, or my villain story, my origin story, kind of anti-hero. I, there was a kid that I, Ted will laugh, there's a kid that I did not get along with when we were younger, and his dad happened to be a football and baseball coach. Um, his dad benched me in football. I did not play. I almost quit. And then he cut me from the baseball team in middle school after I had the like highest batting average the year before. And that was very much for me like going to my dad and being like i'm gonna kill everyone like what what do i do um so he was like get you a hitting coach and go get in the cage and do your thing um and like that was probably the very first time was like i worked hard on something and noticed the difference um and then high school football the high school equivalent of the max rep 225 bench uh, that they do at the NFL Combine. The high school combine into college is 165. How many reps do you think I got? Two? Three really fast ones, and then zero after that. One. 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 So that was my, that was my max. One, One rep max bench, 165. Yes. Um, and our head coach, uh, uh, senior year, not a fan. Um, and... He made fun of me. He's the one who wrote the fucking strength and conditioning program. He made fun of me for how much I benched. <laughs> so I went and found training manuals um, in the winter after football season and got my bench up to 215 and waited for him to make fun of me again. And he was a teacher at the school and he made fun of me in front of everyone. And I was like, what, how much do you think I bench now? And he's like, oh, I don't know, 170. And I was like, 215. Wrote my own program. You ever heard of linear progression? <laughs> he's just like... <laughs> like not happy like we yeah we didn't get along um so those things like the negative things happening i think were so important for me to like figure all of this stuff out but again like after that college was very similar to high school like survive classes and then cram for tests um and it wasn't until crossfit that this concept really made sense to me If you truly want to improve at something, put in the time and you will see like the benefits of doing that. And I really don't feel like I learned that until I was in my like mid twenties, maybe something like that. And you look back on like negative situations or perceived negative situations. And like, I wouldn't be where I am right now, which is in a lot of ways where I want to be as a person without all of that shit kind of happening. But just that those moments of figuring out that that's what it is that you actually do have a lot of say in like where you're headed where you're going how much you can accomplish it's just if you set gigantic goals uh, like you do the you say that you've said the thing at camp a bunch of times stare yourself in the mirror say the goal spin around 360 stare yourself again and be like this is what it would take am i willing to do that cuz yeah. just the first part is not enough like I think it'd be dope to like go to Mars or the moon or whatever. You know what I mean? Am I going to train to be an astronaut? You know, it's probably not like, do I, do I want to die in a space? I don't know. So like it's, I think to bring it back to, to ways that it can be helpful for a listener would be like, how does someone know? Okay. I've accepted the fact that, you know, hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. I've accepted the the universal truth of it, and I'm willing to have delayed gratification. How does somebody know if they're on the right course while they've bought into being patient? Because you could, you could, you know, if, if if the track is linear and you're supposed to go to point A from from point A to point B, and you decide to head off in another direction, it's going to have an effect on what you're doing. 
So you might yeah. buy into patients and then be doing things wrong. How do you know? Mm. You coach. <laughs> Third party. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in the in the context of yeah, CrossFit's unique because you you know you kind of made the point like nobody's going to win the CrossFit Games the first year that they they do something they they step into the sport and it's it's true like for the obvious reason but it's also true that like you could be an exceptional athlete you could be a like you could be a division one football player an extraordinarily high level gifted athlete but there's simply too many things in crossfit to to need to be proficient in that like the odds that you can actually do all of those things and at a capacity high enough to be competitive is basically zero right and it's the and so I, yeah, I mean, having having a coach, having somebody with the experience to tell you like, hey, man, this is what it takes. This is where you're at here, here, and here. And this is where the field is at here, here, and there. And, and like, these are the things that we need to work on. But I think ultimately the, like, how do you know you're on the right track is 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 probably more about how how you tolerate the day-to-day grind of you know working towards that goal and again like let's assume that you know what actually what it actually you've 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 set out the goal and either in your own in your own way or through communication with someone who knows more than you has laid out like okay that's the goal these are the things that it's going to take to get there and you've said okay like i'm on board at least for now it, I think the it's much more of an intrinsic kind of feeling of like, am I still going in and enjoying this? Or even enjoyment might not be the right metric to use. It's like, am I still willing to do the things that are the shitty mundane things that are necessary in order to move the needle in one direction? And in the sport itself, we've talked a lot about ways to, to see and, and understand progress because it's not progress is not linear it's not going to be a constant uh you know this week my back squat is this next the next week it went up five pounds the week after went five pounds up from that it was like they're like all of these levers are getting pulled at the same time which inevitably means that like you know something is going to drop off in favor of something else the goal is just that you know that lever doesn't drop farther than it dropped the last time right the 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 valleys are slightly higher and the peaks you know the general trend is upward so um i think especially in the sport of fitness the 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 progress and the you know the check-in like is it it's it's more a question of like am i still committed to the process am i still committed to finding the next key on the keyboard uh in hopes that you know at some point all of this will will kind of come full circle but because like like we said the 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 dip, the problem with delayed gratification is the delay is undetermined um and there is there does have to be a, a willingness uh a level of patience a level of flexibility with exactly how long that'll take the target's constantly moving you are going to progress at you know you're going to run into roadblocks you're going to get injured you're going to lose motivation you're going to move to a different gym you're going to do all of these things that you have no way of knowing or predicting are going to present themselves as roadblocks and i think having the mindset of that kind of flexibility that feeling of you know it's like i know that these things are going to happen i don't know when they're going to happen but i i'm like a lot of times it's just the recognition that those roadblocks will present themselves and that's okay uh and you know, there will still be an opportunity to put one foot in front of the other to keep the progress going. Um, so I think that's a, I think that's a really good answer. And I think it, it gives context within actual CrossFit. The follow up to that would be, you know, I opened up the phase one Google sheet and the, the breadcrumbs that we leave, you get more opportunities than you think to know where you are on that trajectory. So I got phase one open and the word test is in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 times in week one and then 11 more times in week nine. We don't just do that um, 
as like, where were you at the beginning and where are you at the end? There is an overall overarching theme to, we give you six chances between phase one and phase three to do these tests. Um, CrossFit gives you the open quarterfinals, potentially semifinals, potentially the CrossFit games. You do a local throwdown all the way up to a Rogue or a Wadapalooza. Those are more opportunities. You are given opportunities throughout the year to see where you're at. And the only caveat or way to think about it from a personal standpoint would be at each section of the season, where have you put what eggs and how many into a particular basket? Um, So if you look at phase one and you're like, I really, really, really want to buy in. I I want my 20, my 20 minute, um, row test to see what I get for wattage on that. I'm buying into that and I'm going to do all of the zone two sessions. I might even do the second zone two session on the rower, um, on, on my active rest day. And I really want to see what happens there. If I lean into that and maybe I do that before I do my back squat session every Monday or every Tuesday, which thing do you think will spit out the, the number that you're chasing on the other side? So that's, Throughout the season, those pieces of context, I think, are incredibly important. We need to lean into specific things that we want to get better at, that we need to get better at. Um, but there are so many chances to do that. And it's it's why, you know, if you're on MFT, that's why the three-mile math test is there, even though it's a weird, like, you're giving me a test where my effort isn't, like, the the thing that I'm that's being tested. Or doing all of the wattage tests throughout the year this year on machines instead of just starting at zone one. It's like if you're in zone two, if you're going to make me log 50 hours of this over the course of X period of time, can you show me that it's making a difference and getting your FTP number is a way to do that. So um, you're given the opportunities to see where you're at a lot throughout the year Um and then again, you know, go go back to the sheet here. Uh, handstand push-up session every Monday. You will repeat this workout three more times. Leave room to grow, and it's actually six times because there's a kipping week and there's a handstand push-up week. Um, you know, we do linear progression and a lot of the toe to bar work. Um, you're doing uh, six rounds of easy sets of muscle ups almost every week. Is that number two or three to start, and then four or five to finish? The, those those things can make a huge difference, but we have to notice them. If we put the breadcrumbs out there, and we try to talk about it on the podcast, but there will be people who don't listen to a minute of this, and also are just like, okay, six must six sets of muscle ups. I'm going to get ten, six, three, one, 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 and they're going to do that week after week, and sort of not buy into the delayed gratification even on a short term schedule. So. I think noticing those breadcrumbs and leaning into that stuff can be incredibly helpful to buying into this over a longer period of time. Yeah, the and and just trying to identify those checkpoints, it's it can be super easy, especially when you're looking at your training day, your training week, whatever, and seeing all of these training pieces and to just look at individual individual pieces in a vacuum as a way to measure long-term progress is is not correct and can be is probably more often detrimental than it is helpful um it's we have to you have to be willing to look at things from a macro level and i think those larger checkpoints you know the end of a training phase the you know an in-person competition or something like that can be a really helpful way to to try to kind of gauge like what is my actual what is my actual overall progress looks like am i generally trending in the right direction because ultimately like you it, again in the sport you don't there are just so many benchmarks and metrics that get measured and it's really difficult to manage all of them and so just being willing to say like okay like yep that individual thing moved up i'm happy with that but then there's also the broader picture of like like are are things generally moving in the right direction and do i still have that intrinsic kind of motivation that i that is necessary to put one foot in front of the other and only see small incremental progress over a longer period of time knowing that you know in the long run that is that's how it works and you just don't really have as much control over when 
you're going to see the fruits of your labor come to fruition. I'll, uh, before we get to some, some Discord questions, I'll put a, a bit of a period on this by just saying that we don't check in on uh, progress as a way to decide whether we're going to keep going or not. We check in on the progress to see if we're heading in the right direction. If we're we're looking at that, what's the what's the line, Hunter? A uh, long trajectory to a distant horizon. Low trajectory to a distant horizon. Yep. If we're if we're trying to head in that direction and we're uh, doing a, a backflip into the abyss instead, um, that's a that's a problem. So delayed gratification really would have this part of like you almost need those moments where you're heading in the wrong direction to happen to buy into it on a deeper level and say we got to make a change here we need to do something um yeah so let's jump into uh some discord questions uh the first one was not intended to be for the podcast but i think is a really good question and one that we could and then the other ones are pretty short and mostly just uh jokes about hunter's golf um nice all right mentally how does one prepare for a competition shortly after coming back from a break i had to take a month off for a small surgery and returning has been humbling i have about two months to prep before an indie competition and although i was already expecting to land in the bottom five as i barely qualified i'd rather not completely embarrass myself do i just need to train as hard as possible these next couple of months, or am I overthinking how long it will take me to perform normally? Normally, how long did they say it was the layoff? Uh, it just said short break, month off. Yeah, I mean, so well, I'll I'll pick on the uh, the more objective metrics. It's not going to take you as long as you probably think to get back and do maybe not your your personal peak physical condition but it it one of the most common like conversations i have with athletes at the affiliate level whether it's someone who came got injured just came off of came off of a long vacation a long break whatever it is they they come into the gym their first day and they you know it's a one rep max whatever and it's just like oh my gosh i just did like 50 pounds less than i've ever done like the world is ending and it's a it's a it's it doesn't take you nearly as long to get back to your baseline level of fitness particularly if you've been the longer you've been doing it the easier it is to return to your kind of normal level of training it's not going to be all that pleasant for the first few weeks you're probably going to feel bad you're going to feel out of shape you're going to feel like you've lost a lot of strength and with that comes the internal doubt the you know the conversations you're going to have in your head that i'm never going to get back to where i was i'm never going to you know I, I, i'm not going to be prepared or whatever and then again find the next key on the keyboard you're going to find that one little thing where it's just like oh wow i did i just tied a pr or i'm like oh i i hit a lift that felt like it used to or i actually felt like i had my breathing under control in that metcon you're gonna start to see those tiny little breadcrumbs that say like hey like keep going you're you're on the right track in in keeping with the conversation we just had like you do have to put one foot in front of the other whether it's it training as hard as you can uh like without an objective measure of what that actually means, I'm probably going to say like that probably isn't necessary. A smart re, you know, uh, like ramping back up of volume to make sure that you're not going to beat the shit out of yourself and injure yourself and then put yourself in a deeper hole is probably the right way to do that. You know, any, if, if it was a long layoff, then one workout a day is better than what you were doing before. And you're also setting yourself up for kind of that, you know, what would be more like short, medium term success as far as like getting yourself back into shape. So a lot of what Hunter addressed there was ways to, I don't, I don't know if you, you said it outright, but ways to make mental adaptations, because it sounds like there's a lot of like questioning yourself and your ability within this message. And that will be the biggest thing that you need to lean into having the victories, the little victories that he mentioned. Um, And then also we get wrapped up in like this feels worse or it feels hard. And that's never going away, like ever. 
Like yeah. the resistance that pushes back against us is the gift. It's not the curse. That is the thing that creates the adaptation. Now, when it comes to actual physical adaptation, um, if a competition uses volume to find its winner, then it's not a good competition. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Like if it's just like, let's see who is surviving by the end of this <laughs> versus testing modalities, um, you know, pushing, pulling, all of that stuff. So if you end up going to something like that and it's just an absolute beat down um, for everybody, then you can just shrug it off because it's not really the test that you were after. That happens at a lot of competitions outside of the CrossFit game season. You see like three, four events a day and you're just like, uh, okay, fantastic. What are you testing? Um, but volume can be a useful tool in training to help you overreach a little bit. Standard, like the way that we peak competition, you got two months, um, very low volume, very high intensity at the beginning and the end. And somewhere about a month in, a couple extra pieces mixed in um, to the point where you're questioning whether you can hold intensity. And then that's how you know you've you've gotten to that point to overreach. And then you go back down the hill. It is absolutely plenty of time. In fact, um, that is the exact amount of time <laughs> that we do for competition prep, um, essentially. And uh, some of our athletes that are saying doing rogue prep, like starting rogue prep soon, they just got done in the CrossFit games and, and they haven't done anything. So like, like not, not even, is this possible? Um, it's close to ideal in terms of timing because you can ramp yourself back up into that period of time. So I think leaning into physical adaptation and mental adaptation as you're working your way through, um, you'll be able to get after it once it starts for sure. All right. Can I, this is a good one, Hunter. You're going to like this. <clears throat> I should just read the first like five words. Can I skip MF2 warmups? <laughs> if no. I'm already training, question mark. For example, I like to do my skill piece and then proceed to my MF2. Take my time to settle heart rate and then go directly into the 45 minute part. Am I doing it right? All right. It depends. Uh, okay. Cl uh, classic, classic cop out. the The correct answer is you should do you should do your MF two warm up. Caveat: What was your warm up before your skill session? How long did you rest between your end of your skill session and the beginning of your MF two warm up? And do you understand what the purpose of the MF two warm up is? And can then make an informed decision about exactly how much additional time you need to warm up. So remember. The purpose of the, you know, from a resting state, most of your blood is circulating around your organs and your fucking coconut because that's what your body needs to keep you alive. When you slowly, when you rapidly introduce blood flow to, especially if you're doing something like a C2 bike where it's like very localized muscle fatigue and you try to immediately get yourself up to a place where your heart rate should be, what you're just, you're just, you're just, flooding blood to those muscles because your body's panicking as opposed to a gradual increase of full body blood circulation that is actually going to facilitate the cardiovascular systems that we want. So, you know, you're telling the lungs to start uh, or telling blood to deliver oxygen throughout the body versus like pooling them directly to your quads because your body's like, what the fuck are we doing? Again, this depends, like, I will personally say that, be, and this is exclusively because of how much time I choose to allocate to training, my MF2 warm-up is between 5 and 10 minutes, where I gradually ramp it up, and I'm also willing to take the first 5-10 minutes of my actual timed MF2 session at a heart rate that is lower than what the range might indicate. Again, that said, my goal is not to compete in CrossFit at any level outside of health and wellness, health and longevity. So I'm willing to accept what will end up being a net, you know, not ideal, but acceptable level of training for, for my goals. So factor in your goals, factor in the actual physical amount of time that you have available. The answer to the question is do your warm up. Um, 
If you're looking for a bunch of excuses, I just gave you a handful of them, but ultimately you know uh, what the correct answer is for you based on what you want to get out of it. I suspect you'll have a maybe slightly different answer, Drew, but... So. No, not necessarily. I mean, there's the like, there's the like teacher's pet angle. So I'll, I will give athletes four minutes, four minutes, four minutes, because technically if done really well, precisely, we can mm -hmm. get this done in 12 minutes and Paige will tell me no or ask for permission to do the 15 minute version, <laughs> <laughs> which I mean, the writing's on the wall, I think. In terms Paige of asked Paige asked if we were supposed to turn the homework in during class, didn't you, Paige? <laughs> Damn it. In this Shut context, fuck up, though, Paige. <laughs> I'll take it all day yeah, long. All day um, for sure. I'll just I'll just add a, a personal anecdote in the way that I think about it. If I'm gonna lift or do skill prior to an MF two session, I wear my watch and I pay attention to my heart rate. So if I know that I need to be between a hundred and hundred and twenty heart rate for those first five minutes. Can I keep my heart rate there while I'm lifting and then flushing sets in between? Fantastic. I mean, my lifting sessions now, I do the flushes that you see in the programming, and I do them for a different reason. I do them because I, I literally can lift more weight if I take the time to spend sure. two or three minutes flushing. Um, huge difference when I ski in between my shoulder press sets. Massive difference. If I'm lazy or if I'm like, I got other shit to do, I got to run and fill my water bottle or I got to go talk to a member or I got to go turn the sauna on or whatever, the next set is harder, even with more rest. So that's kind of a separate thing. But if I notice that I did spend the amount of time that I needed to, then I'm in hunter situation where it's like eight to 10 minutes to get there. But I also know that if I need to spend the time doing zone two work that zone one work is also very helpful and i'm just elongating that session and getting more more meters in and sure. getting myself fitter coming out the other side so another example really good example would be we're trying to do the opposite when we come back down and cool down my heart rate does not settle <laughs> it's never settled once <laughs> in my whole life um so I can get away with, again, eight to 10 minutes. And then while I'm walking around the gym, putting my equipment away, you know, getting water, electrolytes, whatever, I can stay moving and keep my heart rate up for four to five minutes. And that's the final four to five minutes there. The yeah. fitter you become, the less any of this matters. Like you need to be on that machine doing the work or on another machine doing the work to get your heart rate to the place where you are going to send the blood out to your whole body so that you can actually use it. So um, the fitter you are, the more that answer is absolutely not. And you need 30 full minutes for warm up and cool down. When is Hunter going to come out with the golf specific training program? <laughs> it's constantly varied functional movement executed at high intensity. It's been out, this it's been would out be for decades. This would be such a good opportunity to make fun of and shit on other companies. And I won't take it. I won't do it. Come I swear. On. Coward. Well, I just did it. Uh, that was oh. kind of the point of that. <laughs> we we coach uh, CrossFitters to get better at CrossFit. And funny fucking thing, when you get better at CrossFit, you're better at life. Um. So, yeah. I ain't teaching any fucking golf. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I have added some supplemental exercises and movements but here we go he's thrown a med ball into the fucking wall i did a few of those and it's just like this game's kind of stupid <laughs> you know that if you're doing it and you don't want someone to walk into the gym then it's not great. yeah that that's actually <laughs> that's a good you metric in a golf club and i'm like yeah. he's swinging a golf club he golfs this makes sense yeah and then it's like i bet you could get your core stronger if you did some fucking crossfit and put a barbell on your back like yeah stretching would be a good idea to make sure you can get into those positions <laughs> but if the bulk of your training is throwing balls if it looks smells and feels like a gimmick you know maybe it's i do think i do think that for like if we were to really actually train for you know there there might be some additional like rotational stuff that's probably the biggest thing that crossfit doesn't get any of and maybe when more specifically like counter rotation which is just like good core work anyway but otherwise like yeah sorry man it's not fucking ski 500 meters five dry swings with the nine iron six burpees do a 
And we don't know whether this person's joking or not. They might they be. Might be. Might they not might be. be joking. Might they not. might not be joking. I have I have programmed a few uh, competitor extra accessory days that look an awfully lot like. <laughs> I've, ta- I've joked with Sherb and Kyle and like this is actually just Hunter's golf accessory program that I'm making members do. Well, until Hunter gets a 152 mile per hour ball speed, I'm going to need him to uh, stick to the class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's it for questions. I actually had a DM. Uh, that I what? wanted to see what your answer what your answer was, Hunter. But we'll keep it quick. We're over the hour. Uh, is it possible to program a fair partner competition, RX, intermediate, and scaled, with a gender shared leaderboard? So I could be on a team with you, a woman could be on a team with a woman, and a man could be on a team with a woman. So it's two people. Whatever. Just you single want. single division, two team of two. Yeah. Is it possible to... for fun but serious? Is it possible to program for that and have it be fair? No, but not for the reason that not because it's not possible to program it well, like that's like the premise of the question is inherently unfair. Like it doesn't matter. Like if if there's no divisions, it's just like you enter everybody's held to the same rules so and there standards. So would be RX intermediate and scaled. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the uh, answer is I think the answer is yes. I'm just thinking of our gym, and like, if the if there was you know if you did machines or something like that, and it was long enough, a lot of the women in our gym would be fitter than a lot of the guys in our gym that are that are RX within that. I think it's possible for fun. Um, yeah, I, I don't you know have to that be it really careful not to have the top of the leaderboard be all male male. Yeah. Burpees, toes to bar, double yeah. unders, running. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, it it would it's possible. I think the question is how exactly what are you trying to evaluate? Are you trying to find the two fittest people on the planet or in your local area or whatever is it just for fun is it he said for fun but serious so that's not the clearest (laughs) for fun but serious yeah thank you so much i'll uh i'll report back on which one it is yeah we're gonna get into some weird fucking weird areas here with that (laughs) that question uh i think yeah it's possible it's possible yeah the the fantastic four is did i say no I said no, it's not possible, but not because of the reasons. So I, yeah, yeah, it's hard. It'll be hard. It, it could be possible, but yeah. Um, we program a competition in the in the fall every year. That's that's teams of four, male, male, female, female, and aside from the lifting event, which we typically do have one lifting event because that's yeah. just kind of your universally scalable. Uh, everything else is very, you know burpee box jump overs to the same height step ups running double unders whatever it needs to be toe to bar um so it is possible to do that and a lot of times you do see the women show out on the team more than the men i think the problem would be in that there's going to be a larger population of men that could do better in the workout than the the population of women typically when you go to a crossfit gym so you might sure. have your you might have a female female team of the two fittest people in the gym that could be on the podium but then as you get to team three four or five whatever is it still fair yeah and i think it's also like well is it like are we are there different weights like is it a 135 95 pound barbell or is it 135 across the board is there a oh a yeah multi- well, that would make it a lot easier to do if there was male and female weight. Right. Is there calorie, you know, 21 slash 18 calories? Is there yeah. the lift would be the obvious issue there? And is it like, well, is there a is there a multiplier of some sort? Or is it sure. just like, nope, total, you know, weight lifted? Because you could also just do a, you know, a, a lifting event that is more based on like volume of reps at a given, at a set weight that's yeah. male, female, because we've done that before. And that's like, that's doable. So... I think it depends on Hunter I guess just it, said yes by giving you all of the ideas that it would take. Yeah, I said no, <laughs> not for the reason you want. Yes, yeah. here's how to do it. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'll change my answer to 
probably. I feel like I kind of already Possibly. gave my final thoughts on the on the original topic. Of I forgot podcast. the original topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're fucking long gone from that. Um, but I will just circle back to um, maybe the more ethereal side of it. Uh, have conversations with different people in different situations. Consume media that feels like it's in your echo chamber and outside of your echo chamber. I try to I try to make sure that I hunt down different perspectives on a lot of topics. And it doesn't necessarily need to change your opinion on something, but it can give you uh, context or a new avenue to explore. So that's something that I'm, I credit a lot of my coaching and programming expertise on things that you would never, like Tyler, the creator on a podcast, someone typically wouldn't, you know, put that in their coaching uh, credential certification course. Um, But going out and exploring different things like that is incredibly helpful to um, progressing, maturing, etc. Yeah, um, I think the most dangerous uh, the 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 athlete to really kind of like be like mm, I don't know about this guy is the one who says, "Hey, I'm here. I want to win the CrossFit Games." It's the athlete who walks in the door and says, "Like, I want to get really good at this." And I saw the CrossFit Games, and I wonder if I'm like able to do it. It's like, my man, like that's the guy, the one who the one who comes in guns blazing with the like that overconfidence. That's the one. It's just like, yeah, I know where this is going. Yeah, you just can't skip ahead, man. You just can't yeah. skip ahead, and it's okay to have those goals out in the distance, but your next goal, your more immediate goal, needs to be realistic. I think yeah. that's a kind of one way to look at it, and you can typically filter for those pretty easily. Did we do it? Done. I think yeah. we did it. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Head to our link in bio on Instagram to get signed up for training camp. Um, make sure you head to discord.gg forward slash misfit athletics to get signed up for our discord. It's a free community. Um, you could fucking sneak in there and see what's up without following the programming. Um, but you're going to be able to converse with people that are following the programming with you, the people that write the programming for you, a really important part of the whole ecosystem that we try to build to get athletes better. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.